This is module four, Mendelian genetics. In this video, video 4-3, gene linkage and the test of independence, we'll be looking at this idea of linked genes again. So we're coming back to the dihybrid cross, and then we're gonna test to see if the probability that genes are linked or not. One example of a linked gene is male pattern baldness. This trait is linked to other traits which are typically found and located on the X chromosome. We look at this, uh, it was difficult initially to determine this because this is a gender related effect. So this is really only something you see in um, males. Half of men are bald by the age of 50 and are more likely to have heart disease, high blood pressure or prostate cancer. And so why would baldness be um, related to your risk factors for these other illnesses? And it turns out that the gene for pattern baldness is closely linked to an androgen receptor gene, which is found on the X chromosome. And the androgen receptor gene is a male sex hormone. And male sex hormones can influence heart disease, blood pressure, and the probability of cancer in a, in a male. Um, and so these, while the androgen receptor gene is found on the X chromosome, which is typically thought to be more female, remember that all men also have an X chromosome. And some of their um, hormone characteristics are controlled by the interaction between the X chromosome and the Y chromosome. The gene for pattern baldness is also on the X chromosome. And so because the gene for pattern baldness and the gene for androgen receptors are on the same chromosome, we refer to them as linked genes. Linked genes cannot assort independently during meiosis. They travel together because they are physically attached to the same chromosome. <clears throat> And so we, Mendel observed this type of thing with his um, pea plants, but he couldn't really explain it. Um, some of his math was off when he was testing for um, whether or not two phenotypes should end up in the, same, in the same organism. So he saw that this was happening for some traits, but not all traits, couldn't explain it, and then just kind of walked away from it, didn't really know how to explain it, and so, so didn't. It wasn't until other investigators um, came, who came after him and had an idea and a concept of the gene in the chromosome and an understanding of meiosis that we were able to figure this out. Okay, <clears throat> so this experiment begins with, do the genes for color, for flower color and pollen shape, which are two totally different traits controlled by two totally different genes, do these genes assort independently? Can we predict that based on these crosses? And so we start with the P generation, two homozygous strains, homozygous for each trait. So homozygous for purple, the purple gene, homozygous, the allele, sorry, homozygous for the purple allele, homozygous for the long pollen seed allele. This plant is homozygous for the red color allele and also homozygous for the round pollen seed allele. Because each parent can only make one type of gamete, the, the fertilization of those two gametes yields only one type of offspring in the F1 generation, purple flowers and long pollen seeds. And so from this, you might assume purple is dominant over red, long is dominant over circular. We then do a self-fertilization of these plants with themselves. They're all heterozygous. And so what we would expect is this nine to three to three to one ratio. That's what we expect to see. <coughs> Sorry for my cough, guys. I've got some allergies I'm dealing with. Okay, this is what we'd expect to see. Nine to three to three to one. However, when we look at the progeny, the actual observed numbers of plants, that is not what we see. Um, this is not a nine to three to three to one ratio. What's going on here? Well, the reason is because, hold on, these genes are linked. Ah, sorry. Okay. Let me, let me back that up, sorry. Um, so the reason why we see a difference between what we observe and what we expect is that possibly these two genes are linked to each other. And so what's going on during meiosis for a genes, genes that are not linked? So let's review this idea of independent assortment again. Genes that are not linked assort independently. They're on different chromosomes. And so if we took, a, if we did a test cross, with a heterozygote parent and one that is homozygous recessive for everything. This means we would expect 50% non-recombinant progeny. They look just like the parents. See, this one looks just like this, and this one looks just like this, and 50% combination of the parents. 
because of independent assortment. And so 50% are a combination of the big M they got from um, this plant and the little M they got from this one and a combination of the little D they got from this one and the little D they got from this one. But this doesn't look like either of the two parents. They're a combination of the two parents. And so is this one. So with independent assortment, for a test cross, half the progeny are non-recombinant and half are, are recombinant. So now what if these genes are linked? And when we say completely linked, this means no crossing over is happening. So let's assume the simplest case, which is there's no crossing over. When genes are completely linked, no recombination is possible because the gene that controls normal leaves travels with the gene that controls plant height every time because these are located on the same chromosome. So in the previous example, these are on different chromosomes and so we can split them up and make different combinations of normal, of leaf type and height. We can make different combinations because we can split them up. But when they're physically attached on the same chromosome, we can't do that, we can't split them up. And so these four possible gametes that we see here are reduced to two possible gametes. One that contains this chromatid and one that contains this chromatid. Can't split them up, they're linked on the same gene. Same is true for this parent. And so when we combine these gametes, we get um, all non-recombinant progeny, right? They both look, all of these plants look like one of the two parents. And so we would get 100% um, parental phenotypes. Is there such a thing, oops, sorry, as incomplete linkage? Is there a possible way that we can split up a linked gene? So now, I'm sorry to complicate things further, but crossing over does exist. And it is usually the case. I mean, crossing over happens um, probably with every gamete formation, if not in one chromosome, then another. And so we have to consider crossing over with linked genes. A crossing over event is the only thing that can split up a linked gene. And the probability that a crossing over event will happen depends on the location of those linked genes. Where are they on the chromosome? And so to refresh your memory, Crossing over happens during meiosis one, where homologous chromosomes pair up, line up along the metaphase plate, and do a bit of swapping, genetic swapping, right? So they're, they're crossing over here. And so when we split them as we enter meiosis two, and then split chromatids, we're going to get some chromatids that look like their parents, and some that are combinations of their parents, and they end up in different gametes. And so with crossing over, we can actually mix up a linked gene. So again, if there's no crossing over, no crossing over takes place, then each gamete receives a non-recombinant chromosome. They have the original combination of A and B here. But if there is crossing over, and that will happen between the two innermost sister chromatids, half of them will be mixtures of the parents and the other half will be looking like their parents. So this is how we can actually split up a linked gene. And so when we go back to this idea, so when we go back to, sorry, let's backtrack to here with this original example, why do we see all of these possible combinations, but not in the right phenotype, not in the right ratio? It could be that these genes are linked and that the probability of crossing over is really small. And so we don't get as many recombinant types as we would expect if they were assorting independently. Let's apply that to this, this new um, example here. Okay. <clears throat> when incompletely linked genes undergo recombination, and so we're back to this MD linkage, and there's a little bit of recombination, the result is mostly non-recombinant progeny and maybe a few recombinant ones because recombination events vary. Um, it's hard, they're hard to predict when they will happen, um, but it's easier to predict where they will happen. If two genes are really far apart on the same chromosome, the likelihood of a, of a recombination event occurring is actually fairly high between those two genes. Um, if two genes are really close together on the same chromosome, then it's less likely that a recombination event will occur between those two genes. And so we get some recombination happening some of the time. <clears throat> so we get a few recombinant gametes that we see down here. 
And we get non-recombinant gametes most of the time. And so if there was no crossing over event between these linked genes, these genes are linked, if no crossing over happened, then we would get 100% looking like the parents. But if there is some crossing over, if there's totally, uh, like there's a 100% chance that crossing over will occur, then we'll end up with half and half. There's not always a 100% that crossing over will occur. There is something maybe below that. And so we would get mostly non-recombinant and then a few recombinant. Okay, so can we test for this? So thinking back to that, we saw we were expecting a nine to three to three to one ratio, but we didn't get that. And so how do we know that that difference between what we observe in the ratio and what we expect is due to chance or not? Is it just purely due to chance? Or is this more of, of um, there's the, or are the genes linked? And so the chi-squared test of independence asks the question, are these genes linked to each other? And that's what explains the differences between observed and expected values. And so we apply the chi-square test again, but we do it in a bit of a different way since we're looking at two different genes. So here, let's start with these bugs, these little buggers. These are cockroaches. And we are looking at two different traits, body color and wing texture. There are two different alleles for body color. There's brown and there's yellow. There's also two textures for the wing, straight and curved. And so we have two different genes, body color, wing texture. Are they attached to the same chromosome or do they assort independently? Well, let's see if we can figure out what we would expect to see if these genes are not linked. So the null hypothesis here is the genes aren't linked and we would expect these things to assort independently. Okay. We have our test cross and we have our results. This is what we observe. So now how do we calculate what we would expect? We have to use this special approach called the contingency table. <clears throat> if this were true, um, we could actually set up a Punnett square and get some expected values, but we can't simply do that. Um, the reasons why we have to use a contingency table over the frequencies we see in a Punnett square are explained in this link here. I'm not gonna get into it into this video because it's a little bit complicated. If you are curious, the reason why is found here on this link. It has to do with survivability. But if you just wanna take it on face value and trust me that you have to use a contingency table to get accurate counts, <clears throat> then let's proceed. So here we have to assume that these genes the Y gene and the CV gene assort independently, they segregate. And so you would consider them separately. Here are the two possible combinations for the CV gene, CV plus CV, and then homozygous recessive. Here are the two possible combinations given these parents for the Y gene, heterozygote and heterozygous recessive. And now in the, in the chart, in the grid, we wanna add in what we observe when these are combined with these. And so when we have totally heterozygote at one and totally heterozygote at the other, that is 63. So you put that number here. If we want to know if we are, heter what's the, um, we have a, a heterozygote at the CV locus, but homozygous at the Y locus, that's going to be these guys here, 33. And so you would fill in those numbers there. Then you would add up the row totals. So this plus this equals 96. And then this plus this equals 105. And then do your column totals. This plus this is 91. This plus this is 110. And then these two together should equal the total number of progeny that you see. These two together also should equal the total number of progeny that you see. And so don't add this don't add all four of these to get your grand total. Just add the columns or add the rows. They should both be the same number. And so then, then let's set it up over here. Okay, so now we want to com compare our observed <clears throat> with our expected. Expected values are calculated as the row total multiplied by the column total for the genotype that you're looking at. And so row total for this genotype what we have in our rows are here. And so the row total for, for Y plus Y, I'm sorry, nope, the rows are the CV gene. Sorry, 
So the row total for the CV, so CV plus CV is right here, 96. So this appears in this row, that row total is 96 and that goes there. The column total would be the Y genes. And so Y plus Y is here, Y plus Y, and that column total is 91. And then we will put that there, multiplied by the grand total, which is 201, or the total number of progeny. That gives us 43.46. Um, we can do that for each of these values and end up with these four expected numbers of progeny. So we do this a little bit different than we do in the goodness of fit test. We must take a different approach. And again, that is related to information found in this link. It has to do with survivability of each type. So now we have expected numbers. We have observed numbers. And so now we apply the chi-square test. We have four different genotypes, so we have to do this test four different times. We have observed numbers of this genotype is 63. We have expected numbers for this genotype, which is 43.46. Square it and divide by expected again for this genotype. Then you would do it for the next one. And so we have 28 observed, 28 observed for this genotype. 47.54 observed, I'm sorry, expected, expected for this genotype, divided by expected, and then do that, keep doing that until you get your chi-square value. Chi-square is not enough, right? We need a degree of freedom in order to determine our p-value. Degree of freedom for a chi-square test of independence is calculated a little bit differently. We're not dealing with simply one observation, simply one gene. We have two different genes. And so it would be the number of observations for one gene, minus one, and, so times, <clears throat> the number of observations for the other gene, minus one. And so that would be two minus one times two minus one, or one. So our degree of freedom is one, spoiler alert, it almost always is, but you must know how to calculate that and you have to demonstrate that you know how to do that on exams and quizzes and stuff. So our degree of freedom is one. Our chi-square value is 30.73. And so let's see, we're restricted to this top row in the black numbers. Where's 30.73? Way off the charts. That is then associated with a p-value, this red value, much lower than 0.005. That means that there is a less than 0.5% probability that the differences you see between observed and expected are due to chance. So you reject the null hypothesis that the genes are not linked because our p-value is so small, suggesting that they are linked. There's a low probability of chance that can help us support that the genes are not linked. So they are linked. We reject that null hypothesis. Okay, let's come, we'll practice that more with a problem set question. Let's come back to this idea that distances between genes um, can relate to the, the probability that recombination or crossing over will occur between them. <clears throat> when we talk about distances on genes, on gene maps, we refer to them as map units. One map unit is, is related to a 1% chance of recombination. And so if two genes are only one map unit apart, there is a 1% chance that they'll recombine, that, there's, that they'll actually swap um, genetic material. There's such a small distance between them, right? A really tiny distance between them means that a crossing over event would be unlikely to split those two genes up because there's not a lot of space between them for a crossing over event to happen. However, if there is a large difference between them, um, in map units. So let's say this gene here and this gene here, they're on two ends. That means a crossing over event can happen along all of this distance of the chromosome. And so that means crossing over would be very likely between two genes that are really far apart. And so their map units are higher because the percent recombination, the chance recombination that occur between them is going to be a lot higher. 
Now, for two genes that are really far apart on the same chromosome, it's possible that multiple crossing over events can happen between here. So between maybe this gene and this gene, you know, there's maybe a 30% chance of recombination here. Between this gene and this gene, that number goes up. Between this gene and this gene, not only is there a really high chance of a crossing over event, but there's an even higher chance that two will occur at the same time. And so this is what a double crossing over event looks like. We've got two genes, A and B, very far apart in the same chromosome. And then we have one crossing over event here, which would serve to mix this chromatid up, right, to be big A and little b. But because A and B are so far apart, it's possible that another crossing over event corrected them and brought the big B back over. And so what would that look like on the resulting chromatid? Well, we would have big A cross over and then cross over again. And so that would flip the middle out, but the ends would remain the same. And being able to distinguish between progeny that are produced by a double crossing over event would be impossible. There's actually, it's really hard to distinguish between them. So genes on different chromosomes look like genes that are located very far apart on the same chromosome in terms of their recombination rates. So it's impossible to tell them apart. So genes could either be not linked at all and on two different chromosomes, or they could be actually linked and on the same chromosome, but very far apart so that they look like um, they are not linked.